before we start, I'm just going to say I like this way more than I expected to. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome back to the Men of Steel podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, J. Mike Folson. Welcome back, everybody. So glad to have you guys today. Yeah, today is a really fun day because, so just by virtue of the nature of this podcast, where we look at lots of Superman content or Superman adjacent content, and just because I have a lot of experience <laughs> in that, and uh, to a certain extent, this this podcast is me being like, let's let's read this book with J. Mike and, and a guest and, and chat about it and Usually I'm not coming in cold uh, versus today. We are talking about the animated Death of Superman movie, which I had never seen before we decided that we were going to do a bunch of material about the death of Superman and the return of Superman. So we have watched now Superman Doomsday already. We read the comic last time, and this time we we're talking about the animated Death of Superman. And holy shit, I really liked it. And I can't wait to have this conversation because today we are d- joined by Duke. Hey, everybody. Duke, welcome back. I am so glad to have you here for this conversation. Thanks. I like talking about Superman dying a lot. <laughs> hey, hey, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, for like 50 years, he was definitively like, yeah, no, he doesn't die. And now it's, it's just like, like every story he's in. Yeah, he, 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 could, die. he, he could die. He could die. <laughs> yeah, like, let's kill him off in various ways. No, I, I know. There are all those imaginary stories. And as I was saying it, I'm like, well, no, I mean, like there are stories where he died. It's just it wasn't the thing he was known for. And then. <laughs> Because there was this big event comic in the 90s. Now he kind of is. Yeah. Gloves are off. Everybody can die for good. There's something to be <laughs> said about how the, uh, was it the Jerry Siegel one? The Death of Superman story is still kind of like really kind of like harsh where it's like, geez, you really took this character away from him and this is how he's going to kill him off. Like <laughs> no mercy, just dead. Yeah. That's that's the imaginary one with, with Lex. Yeah. With the clip. Right? Where, where yeah. Lex is like, I've reformed. I reformed. I would do all these great deeds. Hey, you want to test set this gear for kryptonite? <laughs> <laughs> I actually did a, uh, I, I wrote a, a a play that we did for a stage reading of Lex Luthor giving a monologue to Superman's dead body. And it was deliberately homaging that specific comic. Oh, that's awesome. Where he had, we had an actor who was like, like down with like green light flash or like shining right on him, like a green uh, spotlight. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so it was just like green beam. And then we've got a, a bald actor reading this, this like intense monologue about how it was necessary to remove Superman from the world uh, because he was making the world worse. And uh, I was deliberately thinking of that, but uh, no, we're not talking about Lex Luthor outsmarting Superman today. <laughs> we are talking about a knockdown drag out fight that, uh, was way better than I expected. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Like yep. After Superman Doomsday, I was you're like, oh, okay. But this one, kind of, I was like, oh, okay, I can kind of dig this. is This is hitting all the right spots for me. Yeah, Cyborg got his butt kicked. You know, it was great. It was a great day. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was a great. Day. It's it's one of those things where it was like when it was announced initially. I'm like, oh come on, guys, can we not just prove me right in the idea that DC only wants to tell three stories and that's Death of Superman, Dark Knight Returns, and I guess Flashpoint now. <laughs> and and I, I came into it dreading it. But the the announcement of Peter J. Tomasi was writing it. Uh, we're not using Alan Tudyk's Superman. We're using Jerry O'Connell. And I'm like, okay, I like Jerry O'Connell. And Rebecca Romaine Samos as Lois Lane. Rebecca Romaine, right? Like, not yeah. San Samos. As Lois Lane and oh, they're married and they have chemistry. That's that's nice. And the trailer came out, and my reaction was, "Holy shit! They just wrote a story. <laughs> they didn't write six issues of Superman punching Doomsday as the panel gets progressively bigger." <laughs> and I was incredibly shocked by this movie, by watching it and going, "This is one of the few times where they because they they have animated movies where they explored." the Superman Lois Lane relationship and how he's, you know, kind of, he wants to be with her, but he's afraid of revealing his secret identity. I think that was explored in the Brainiac movie where 
it was, was it was Superman Unbound, where they kind of explored like he wants to go further with her, but he he can't compel himself to. I think so. I want to say it was because it felt like a little bit of a an already done routine at this point with these animated films. But I felt with this one, it it felt a lot more grounded. Yeah, they did a really good job with a lot of relationships. Like, uh, mm-hmm. they, like they did a really good job with like the extended Superman universe. Like, he yes. has a big supporting cast in this movie, and I was like really excited about all of it. It wasn't it wasn't just the Daily Planet. It it, it was all of the Daily Planet. Plus, also Bibbo Babowski. We had Dan Turpin and Maggie Sawyer. You know, like we're really setting up this world of the status quo Superman. Like. The, yeah, like one of the reasons I was like skeptical going into it is that they're using his like new 52 based outfit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and the new 52 movies didn't really do any of them, any like surface whatsoever. It's like, yeah, we didn't, we, we don't really understand these characters as people. They just had justice league films. So like, who the hell are they as people? Right. Yeah. They were like, they were adapting the justice league stuff from new 52, which is like, not, yeah. not the it's, cream of the crop, yeah. the new 52. <laughs> <laughs> it sucked. That that just the ground was pretty awful. Yeah, so it so it had a look that wasn't great, and it has a story that uh, you know it is it is a common response to be like, okay, cool, he fights a guy and dies. Like we've complained about that now the the two times that we talked about Superman Doomsday fights already, uh, with us trying to pick out the things that we thought were really good, and then this one came out, <laughs> and like all of a sudden I was like, holy shit, it is really compelling, and I'm also like kind of glad that I hadn't seen this by the time we talked about the comic because in the con- like in our discussion of the comic I was saying all these things that I thought were great that they were able to do in it and then I see this and some of the some of the con- concerns I had about adapting it to another format were actually addressed here which was really great and it gave me a chance to sort of like articulate what my concerns were thinking that they could not be met having seen Superman Doomsday which <laughs> is just such an inferior product. And like, it's so like, there's, there's one thing that is in that movie that I think is, is truly a good element of the doomsday stuff. Uh, And that is when they show like from doomsday's perspective that he has like this sort of like mechanical view to everything, which I think is good. I don't necessarily know if I want that in every version, but I thought it was good there. Um, Meanwhile, here we've got Superman, like the, the justice league. And we got, we have the big seven. Yeah. And, yeah. and Hawkeye or Hawkman. I, uh, there, there, was always that, there was always that joke where it was like, you see, this is what happens when you get the fake Justice League to help Superman during the Doomsday fight. If the real Justice League were here, they'd actually step up. And then you get the real Justice League and it's like, no, they're completely outmatched by this engine of destruction. Yeah, they, they tried their hardest. They tried their, <laughs> and again, they, again, I, I, I had to ref, re, restate that I'm not a big fan of the new 52 Justice League movies. I think Justice League War is very kind of tedious towards the second, third act, where it's just fighting. And I think Throne of Atlantis has some merits. But between that, this movie and Justice League Teen Titans, this was one of the few times where they felt like a team of friends, mm-hmm. of colleagues. Yeah. And it and I think so much of what makes this movie work is that it takes the time to really make you care about these characters. So when you finally do put them through hell in the third act. There, there's an actual visceral feeling of, holy crap, these guys might die. Or at least Hawkman should die. I mean, it's, <laughs> yes. I mean, it's Hawkman. He just comes back anyway. So there's... Yeah. They give him a couple months to be back to normal. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, Hawkman's still alive. I'm like, he is? Really? really? <laughs> I feel bad for Wonder Woman. Because, oh my gosh, yeah. she got the crap beat out of her. <laughs> yeah. But that's appropriate, though, because, like, she's the she's the one who's going to put up the best fight. Yeah. Uh, which means that that fight is going to be the most mm-hmm. taxing on her directly. Kudos kudos to them getting rid of that ponytail and letting her hair flow. She looked yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. When, when, the, when the, the bracelet popped, I was like, oh, snap, it just got real. It just it's got It's about real. to go down. <laughs> <laughs> she was punched so hard that her hair became <laughs> sexier. <laughs> her hair became longer. It's like, oh. Maybe yeah. Doomsday, I mean, so, Doomsday should just punch her into a better costume. <laughs> I don't like that I, yeah. roller derby costume I'm at all. Yeah, the, the outfits in general have some issues. Like Green Lantern has the unnecessary, like just like green accents yeah. all over his yeah. outfit, and like the flashes, like the lines on the costumes. You know, they're, they're, it's the designs they were working with, and there's only so much you can do. But yeah, like 
the the new 52 look for Superman, I don't objectively hate, but I think it takes a lot to make it look right in a in a shot. And I don't think the animated format is really good for it. Like that shade of blue probably works better in live action than it would on like in a in an animation cell. And I yeah, he just he just doesn't quite look enough like Superman. But you know what? It, the big thing is he acts like Superman. Yeah, he perf- yes. like he behaves like Superman. The world treats him like Superman. He's not just some superhero. Uh, everyone really loves him. And I think this movie does a really good job of setting up that this is a world where people have come to rely, respect and enjoy the, the existence of Superman so that his death actually means something when it happens. Yes. Especially the Henshaws. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Hank Henshaw, <laughs> who's usually a weak link to me as far as Superman villains. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. they did a really kind of a little heavy handed approach to it, especially when he's, you know, they, they, the meteor's coming. He's like, well, Superman's going to save us. Superman's going to save us. It's like, all right. He always saves us. He's always saving. <laughs> you can always count on Superman. And it's like, okay, you can dial it down a little bit, buddy. But yeah, and I, I think that's, again, one of the strengths of this movie is that it, it feels like a movie about a guy who's a pillar of the community. And they establish what communities he's a part of. The, the Justice League, the Daily Planet, his family, the, the streets of Metropolis. And they really make it so that, you, you know, once you get rid of this guy, what happens? Everything falls it, apart. It's like, yeah, it's like the story of um, Balder dying in Norse mythology. Once, you know, Balder goes, it starts raining. Like, it, like the sun doesn't come up again. Because this guy was so beloved by everybody. Yeah. And in both cases, they can't be killed. You, yeah. that, that can't be the, the way that they <laughs> die. And then all of a sudden, oh, no, that's that's a mistletoe arrow. And yep. oh, oh our, our, our invulnerable light being is dead. Yep. Oops. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, no, our slightly Jesus-y guy died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting looking at this whole thing where – Again, the the main story is this fight with Doomsday. Mm-hmm. And so how do you keep that interesting? How do you how do you space it out? You know, when they did Superman Doomsday, it the fight ends up being only the first like third of the movie, maybe first half of the movie, and then it's all about like the resurrection stuff. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. to be fair, this is a two-part movie, the second part being the return of Superman, and that so it, in a certain sense that is the how this is split up, but it's spending the full time actually focusing on the the rising stakes, you know, we establish a, a, a status quo at the beginning. You know, we get we get criminals who are exactly the type of criminals I want in a Superman yes, cold exactly. opening because it's Intergate. powered armor criminals <laughs> who are you know it's Mannheim who is like a name but isn't like a big villain, so you don't feel like you're shortchanging that character. Uh, like they're, we're getting the appropriate amount of like respect. It's here. like Spider Man fighting Hammerhead. You, you want to yeah. see the cold <laughs> open of Spider Man fighting Hammerhead, and Bruno Mannheim is Superman's Hammerhead. He's just yeah. a mafia guy who works for, like, the devil, you know, like, or <laughs> yeah. space devil. And, and it's perfect here because it's intergang. It, they say it's apocalypse tech, but it's also Lex Luthor tech. And those armors look like classic Lex Luthor armors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So here for all of that, like, it, you know, it puts up not much of a fight against Superman, but that's the point. Like, we see how, like, conventional arms can't really handle these things, but Superman shows up. And we've got a bit of this, like, Morrisonian style, like, nod to the golden age where he's a little bit more uh property damaging in his being super like he he smacks him down really hard uh and as a result causes some damage but he did then you know he doesn't clean it up himself but he arranges (laughs) it for to be cleaned up very you do deal with it nerd (laughs) (laughs) which i i loved that um the the characterization on both flash and green lantern i adored in this movie they both had like real personalities that felt good i i admit that barry feels like wally but I, I th- I, but that's just a common complaint at this point. I think with, with this version of Barry, it's like he is a bit funny, but they play up. He's a he's a hopeless nerd. So I'm like, OK, there, there's a, there's enough Barry there where it's not too much like Wally until he starts making fun of Bruce. Then it's, right. like, it's, t- it's TV Barry. <laughs> yeah. TV Barry. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, fine. That's what that's what people know at this point. I'm not going to get really like that mad because he's perfect in the spot. Yeah. I just wish that like under the mask he had red hair but we don't even see it so it doesn't even matter if you don't think too much about it (laughs) but i mean they call him barry at one point but like you know not 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 the point uh hal jordan i thought was a lot of fun my head candy for the dc league of super pets movies that's wally because that guy's got freckles (laughs) so i totally get it but yeah like we get 
you know, a, a really solid Green Lantern when they're teasing Batman about having a parent teacher conference like that, I thought was just a really good moment there. Uh, <laughs> it does speak to how compressed this timeline is that like Damien's a factor in everything. Yeah. Uh, I like the danger room type fight that, uh, that, Wonder Woman and Superman are in and where they, they get to scold each other about using code names versus not code names. Yeah. <laughs> that was like a good part of like sort of establishing what Superman feels like. He's he is very introspective in this all like um, without us getting like a voiceover or thought balloons or something to that effect. Like, you know, he, he is really concerned about moving forward with Lois and talks about it a lot with the leaguers. Uh, who want to talk about it as opposed to their annual budget stuff, because like, this is the most like, <laughs> like bureaucratic version of the justice league you, you could imagine <laughs> in addition to everything else. I guess not the most because, because they're not like clocking in, clocking out or anything like that. But it did make me think of like squad and Supreme where it, it, there's like this pageantry to being part of this like special club. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, Squad and Supreme. I mean, I do, I do like the fact that she brought up the fact that her, her, uh, her little doll or not dolls, but action figures did wonderfully this, this year, and she'd be willing to chip in whenever Bruce couldn't hand or take over for. Her. And I was like, oh, the little bander makes it all worth it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, like that made me the... think of the failed Wonder Woman pilot with Adrian Palicki, where like she's got like a merchandise. Oh god. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk about pants to be darkened. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gosh, that show. See, I got a, I got an asset debris laugh from you. I know it. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, SF debris is great. And if people aren't following his content, you should check that out because uh, great insight into all of this material. But yeah, I like I just love this bigger world that we open the characters in. And then I was a little curious, like what the deal with Lois and Superman were. Um, if when we talked about Superman Doomsday, it was really weird that they were clearly having sex, but she didn't know who he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, like that was just like, a, oh, that's feels like you're crossing the line there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in this case, it's 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 a lot better. Like, for one thing, she is dating Clark in secret. So at first I was like, you know, because we see them uh, Lois and Superman together. And I'm, I was like, oh, does she not know? OK. Uh, OK, sure. I, I, I guess. And then it turns out she's with Clark. I'm like, oh. Oh, maybe maybe she does know, but it's all a secret. Oh, she doesn't know yet, but they they are okay, cool, uh, okay. And and I thought it was like fun how that was a big thing Superman was going through, like that him coming coming out, but like <laughs> like him, yeah, 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 him coming out to Lois as Superman uh, was awesome. was a thing that was going on in his head that like, and it's part of this big relationship moving forward about how important she is, and Mon Pa Kent are there. Uh, are all nice elements to sort of like increase the tension of like, well, I've got to protect the city because all the people I love are here. Yeah. I will say that I thought the, the whole him coming out of Superman thing was kind of like boring because it's like the whole I'm Batman thing that everyone, <laughs> everyone chokes about. But he's like, look at me, I'm Superman. I think, I think, you know, <laughs> see, to your point, it is a bit lackluster how he reveals it because he's literally sitting across from her at a bar. Yeah. And he's like, close <laughs> Superman. Like it would have been a lot more like funnier if it was like the Donner films where it's like, you know, uh, Lois, I, I have something to tell you. And he like falls over and she's like, Clark, Clark, Clark. And he flies up and she's like, oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All those years of trying to prove that you're Superman and you son of a bitch. Yeah, that that we're kind of missing. But it is at least nice to get because they they wanted to deal like it felt like a justifiable reason for the justice leaguers to be like, Hey, no, you handle this thing. You're coming out to your <laughs> yes. girlfriend as, <laughs> as Superman. It made sense yeah. Like, yeah. because we established that they have that kind of convivial relationship with each other. Um, the, the league, I mean, and that they understand that this is important for Clark specifically. And they're like, no, no, you go do you. And then it gets too crazy. It's like when you take off a day at work and like the co your coworkers are doing fine until like an emergency happens and you have to come in. Yeah. You come back and the office is on fire and it's like, ah, yeah, exactly. And again, I wouldn't believe the Justice League doing this in the other movies, but because Tomasi did such a great job establishing they're all allies, they're all friends. This isn't Batman barking orders at everybody and they all listening. It make it feels right. Like, yeah, just have your date, Clark. Have mm -hmm. a have a day off, Clark. Nothing can go wrong. Everything will be just fine. <laughs> Why are you we saying that this? like that, Barry? <laughs> foreshadowing <laughs> and then and then like in, in like uh the irishman 
it just like there's a free like a still screen of like Barry Allen, and then it says like Barry was killed by Doomsday the following day. <laughs> <laughs> he was loved by all. Yeah, a lot a lot of people should have gone down there, but it would have been kind of dope. But yeah, I get yeah, it. especially the sequel when you have to get rid of the Justice League anyways, and it's like, well, you could have killed or put some of them in like a coma. <laughs> Yeah, Hawk that man. does ex- explain why they're not. Yeah, it's Hawkman. <laughs> yeah. Hawkman's like, here we go again. <laughs> so at the end of the movie, when when they're like congratulating everyone who fought in the battle against Doomsday and acknowledging that Superman had died and was like the, the real person doing it, all, <laughs> they're like, end the league. And they cut to Hawkman. And like Hawkman's, like the helmet design that they give him makes him look like he's like a bit cross eyed. Yes. <laughs> And so I couldn't help but think it, it's just like derp, I got to hit the guy with the mace. It's good. Like <laughs> he's not all there yet. He's he's got to recover no. a little bit. Well, but Hawk, but Hawk it's Mace. also Hawkman. So is he ever all there? Like Hawkman's no. like <laughs> Hawkman's like I'm so fucking quitting. <laughs> I'm getting too over this crap. <laughs> I mean, the, the, it's like that's the that's the spot where like a classic leaguer is not a more impressive one than what we got in the comics. Like you know. In terms of of the trade off of the the comics like Justice League roster that fought Doomsday versus this, Maxima is pretty one to one with Wonder Woman here, and Bloodwind is literally Martian Manhunter. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, f- yeah, fine. Like <laughs> he's Martian Manhunter going like, through a bit. Yeah, and, and like G- Guy Gardner and and Green Lantern, like or Hal Jordan, are like comparable in a fight. You know, yeah. like we're not we don't need to really like stress too much about like the power discrepancies of the Sinestro Core Ring versus the Green Lantern Core Ring. Um, but then the rest of them like. Yeah, you got Flash is, is is great and Cyborg is great and Batman. Batman's there. Probably he should have died several times, but like he he doesn't because he's Batman. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was like, that's not it's never gonna happen. You know, tra- <laughs> trade off for like ice and fire and and Booster Gold would have done a lot better than Hawkman in that situation. Yeah, for one thing, what? his force field would allow him to survive at every point. <laughs> what? That's crazy. Plus, you know, he was created by one of the guys working on that book, so you'd be like, hey, he's just not that harmed. <laughs> yeah, also true on that that one, which I realized we didn't bring up when we were talking about it. It's like, yeah, Booster Gold is Dan Jurgens' baby. So <laughs> yeah, like, I'm not gonna let, I'm gonna like let you hurt my himbo child. Yeah, not 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 too bad. Not too bad. Just take take his toys <laughs> away his for a little bit. <laughs> Have Doomsday smash Ted Cord's head in with a car door. That's fine. Yeah, uh, I did like the synergy of using Hawkman's mace with the Flash. Like that, I was like, "Oh, yeah." That you would think you would just do that more often. Yeah. Where it's like, "Here's my here's my cool gimmick weapon, Flash. Take it and do it. Yeah. Do it good." If anything, it's like we really don't need Hawkman. We just need this damn mace. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna sideline you for a while, but let us borrow your weapon to somebody who can use it better than yeah. you. Yeah. Um. So, it, in terms of like the actual like, all right, can can this league? hold their own Uh, they do a pretty good job of justifying why they can't hear um for one thing this does such a good job of having super fast doomsday like he is so brutal at every point you know we we introduce him after the initial asteroid falling uh we introduce him crashing into the ocean and dealing with a bunch of atlanteans and that's pretty fucking brutal Um, and they they immediately establish like oh yeah no this is going to be not not fun like there's no no one who's going to no one's getting out of these situations in a way that is not horrifically scarred. Yeah, because that you had like the uh, the scientists. I wanted to say wanted to go down, but Lex kind of forced him down there to go see what was going on. Yeah, yeah. and they get obliterated too. <laughs> yeah, like the the first guy, like he, Doomsday punches through the like the super thick glass, crushes his head, and then uses him to then swing the submersible into the the, the ocean floor uh, and fuck it up more. It's yeah, it just starts off gory. And- yeah, like, I will say, like, Doomsday in this movie, he does, like, he he grabs people's head and uses them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, like, blunt objects. And I'm like, wow, this guy is, holy crap. <laughs> he he is a big, uh, this is going <laughs> to, he, he's a big tool user in this movie. Uh, like, he really loves throwing things at people, uh, which is, is a really good element to this character. Like, he's he's so fast and he's so vicious and he, he will continue pummeling a thing once it's down until it's dead. Um, and every time he is forced to reassess his combat situation, his natural response is to chuck very big things at whatever has like surprised him uh, and then follow it up by like jumping at super speed and uh, and hitting the thing really hard after that, which works pretty well for him in this movie yeah. as a strategy. 
you know, like him taking down the Justice League. I'm like, oh, this is it's really impressive that it's working as well as it is. And oh, wow, he took out Hawk. I mean, you know, obviously he takes out Hawkman pretty fast. <laughs> uh, but, then, uh, but then he takes out Green Lantern really quickly and like Flash barely saves him. And you're like, OK, cool. I am seeing how we're establishing the the power curve here. Um, but then like one, once Superman actually comes into the fray and you have a fight. Well, really, first with, with Wonder Woman, because. Mm-hmm. You know, we get a little bit of that with Martian Manhunter, but it's mostly that Martian Manhunter is intangible and he's not able to do anything until he's able to force Martian Manhunter to become solid yeah. for just long enough to prevent Batman from dying. And then just tosses him immediately into a gas station and it explodes. And then Martian uh, Manhunter lets out this blood curdling scream. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he is down for the count. Which is, yeah. which is still <laughs> horrific, even on my rewatches where it's like, oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, OK, all right. We just took out Green Lantern and Martian Manhunter and it wasn't a big deal. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that was a two. And Batman is hitters. good at running at this point. Yeah. He's not doing much. <laughs> like another Doomsday <laughs> movie fight. Batman's smart enough to go. Oh, God, I'm so I'm screwed. I got to run away. Oh, shit. I got to hide under <laughs> something. Which is totally fair, dude. I get it. He's taking out gods and demi- demigods. Like, I'm going to hide over here in the like, corner. This isn't Bane. <laughs> Where's 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 Doomsday's big pump thing? I can throw my battering at, and then it destroys the pump thing, and I can kick him. He does. Yeah, where's that. where's the quick time sequence that I can exactly. you know press in the right <laughs> <laughs> the right order to leave him exposed so I can hit him one time that actually matters. Then I dodge three times, and then the quick time sequence again begins. Again. Yeah, like Doomsday, like corners Batman. Batman's like, can you at least give me a riddle or something? <laughs> Here's a riddle. Die. It's not a riddle. It's not a riddle. Oh, this, Batman. How fucked are you today? <laughs> Very. Yeah, but then but then Superman actually arrives and it, you know, it makes sense. The news all of a sudden is picking it up. It's like, OK, cool. All right. You know, duty calls. Let's let's go deal with this thing. And man, it, like it takes a lot to really establish like how powerful Superman is in one of these fights, because it's, you know, when you're fighting two comparable beings, like some of those feats don't really show up. And so. In both cases, they're moving so fast and they are doing such interesting things with their powers. And interesting doesn't have to be like deeply complex stuff, but like Doomsday is is very calculated in how like wh- what he hits and how he hits it and what things he's using as weapons at any given time. Um, and it really shows just how how fucking terrifying this thing would be. Uh, in a way that isn't just like the Hulk with spikes. And I actually kind of like the way they designed Doomsday in this to be more a tall. Like he has more realistic human proportions than he's often drawn. Like he he often is drawn with like really really broad shoulders and you know like really Hulk like. Mm-hmm. And in this case, he's he's more just huge. Um, and I feel like that kind of works with like how they show him being so fucking fast. I will say that I, I did like that they carried over the costume that he he first appears in, uh, the suit that he's in. The uh, containment suit when he first lands. Yes, the same suit from the other from the other materials. And uh, how did, did they establish that he was Kryptonian here? <laughs> it's implied because he just comes he, out he with laser say, vision, and I was yeah, like, that, "Oh that's, wait, <laughs> that surprised me when that when that showed yeah. up." And it's also funny because it, it surprised me, and then my head came. I'm like, "Well, when Jimmy Olsen became Doomsday and All Star Superman, Jimmy Olsen developed heat vision too." I don't know why he went to Jimmy Olsen and All Star Superman, but I, I, I guess technically, since you know. The canon origin for Doomsday is, you know, clone Kryptonian a- baby. You might as well have heat vision. <laughs> yeah. But it, like, it just came out of nowhere. And I was like, oh, but, uh, all right. It, it, to, to, me, to me, it actually, <laughs> it works because he saw Superman use it and said, oh, wait. Yeah, that's, that was I enough, do like, that so too. Can he just copy abilities at this point? Or is like that? I, I was wondering if that's what they were going with. Um but he doesn't re- like copy any other abilities at any point. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it is just he manifested it. And now it could be that he evolved it in the battle because he clearly is evolving. <laughs> like the spikes he, and things. Are- yeah. The spikes <laughs> are, are getting bigger and he's getting bigger. Like he starts off smaller. And at, by the end of the fight, he is much, much taller than he was. Doomsday's evolution is whatever it needs to be. Right. I mean, if someone were to throw him so many times, he just you should just like grow wings, but he won't. I mean, we can't have him turn to Dr. Ivo's android out here. That'd be too broken. <laughs> then Amazo would sue him. <laughs> that could you and imagine? Then he, would, he would counter sue and be like, I'm not ripping off you. I'm ripping off the super adaptoid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Now it's got to be a DC and Marvel case. Great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but Doomsday is so it is so interesting in this movie just from the way they they animate him from the way he fights like it like I just did not expect any animated version to have as good choreography as this fight ultimately has. And then it's, you know, so well set up beforehand like where you really care about this fight because because we had great scenes with the Justice League, because we had great scenes with Superman and Lois and with like the 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 time where they're over at Mon Pa Kent's or, or rather <laughs> at Clark's with Mon Pa Kent there. Uh, and first off, they're just like teasing Clark in ways that like parents do. And it's just like kind of perfect. Uh, and, and that I especially love all of the puns when they get to Lori Lamaris. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like they just start doing fish puns like crazy. And like, if you don't know what they're talking about, you you won't really pay attention to it. Like, you know, like they said, she was on the swim team, but she was quite a catch. <laughs> She was going to catch, uh, and then it was something like, and I'm making halibut tonight. And like, like, <laughs> like all these like God. fish puns. Eventually Lois is like, did you, did you just, Clark, did you fuck a fish or something? Right. <laughs> so, yeah, Clark's just like, please God, make it stop. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. They broke up because she lay a clutch and asked him to, to spray over them. <laughs> That got real dark, or real gross right there. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> she visited a Long John Silver's and never came back. <laughs> but but it was such a it was such a delightful scene, and it really felt like we were building out this like universe of mm-hmm. of what Superman has gone through. Like th- these moments of like, oh man, was he actually Superboy in Smallville? Even if it wasn't like a, a public thing, like maybe people didn't know about it at all. But you feel like you have that world of Superman. Uh, in fact, the only thing that they are fairly explicit. He doesn't have of his like traditional Superman stuff is that at the end of the movie, the fortress of solitude is created. And so it's like, Oh, well, I guess he didn't have that part already. Yeah. That's, that's, that's something where it's like, you, you want to a- attach these movies to the new 52 comics because they're so derived from it. But at the same time, they don't really match up a lot because the these these Justice League films initially Justice League films were just kind of like we're doing the Jeff John stories which ones uh Justice League War Throne of Atlantis and then they tease another movie at the end of Throne of, of Atlantis they never continued that thread they never continued that thread even though it was clearly going to be like forever evil or whatever and and so it was it was kind of these characters were a bit barren and and so with this movie not only the advantage of fleshing out this Superman, but also getting to like really play with, Hey, we can do anything with this guy's universe. Now we can just incorporate Lori Lamaras, even as a background joke, or we can have him have the rocket. And so <laughs> Lois Lane can meet the eradicator system, which I thought was very clever mm-hmm. because that's, that's a very important thing that they didn't establish before these films. And you know how big a player Eradicator is later on, especially in the whole reign of the Superman stuff. And I just, I just loved it. I, I honestly think one of my favorite things about this movie is that, yeah, I jokingly said this is a movie where they wrote a story and then attached that to Superman. But it, the story itself and that Superman are are thematically on the right level. It's the same level. It's, it's the, it's a story of Superman's vulnerability and how far is this guy going to be vulnerable? And he starts off as very guarded and he has to slowly kind of uncouple these force fields. He's built around himself and how vulnerable is he willing to go? He's willing to die for the woman he loves. That's his vulnerable like that. Like he's so vulnerable. He's mortal at the end. Yeah, with wonderful illusions, like in his last like time talking to Lois before he like goes into the fight, uh, he gives a like, you've got me, who's got you uh, line in there. And it's like, oh, man, they are, they love every aspect of Superman yeah. in this movie. <laughs> I'm glad someone does. <laughs> <laughs> well, like so when we were talking about the comic, I, I was discussing how it felt to a certain degree like a victory lap. Uh, of just being like, look at all the stuff we've done with Superman since since Man of Steel, since Crisis on Infinite Earths rebooted everything. Look at, you know, this celebration of all the weird shit that we've done in the books since that point. You know, we we get moments with Supergirl, we get moments with Maxima. Like, you know, it, sure, it's because of the Justice League, but Maxima had been a big plot point 
in the like in the post crisis era of Superman. We get all the stuff with Cadmus. You know, we're we're dealing with Lex Luthor Jr. And this movie has to deal with the fact that it doesn't have that pre established like lore to build on, you know, and, and the reign of Superman goes even further with it because we get all the stuff connected to Mongol and we get the stuff connected to the Eradicator and Hank Henshaw and all, you know, it gets even crazier. So the fact that this movie sets up pretty well, all four of the, like the Superman imposters yeah. in a way that doesn't feel like <laughs> either shoehorned or, or awkward or, or anything weird. Like it does a better job with Hank Henshaw by virtue of him being, like a reverse flash style, like, Oh man, my great hero. Yeah. Like he's going to save us, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I, and I think I, I know I'm not uh, covering the next week with you. I like the fact that it was like, what if we explored harder? The idea of Hank Henshaw's cyborg Superman being kind of like a religious cult leader. And I, and they, they, they bring it up. Like there's this guy that just gave way to reason because he believed Superman's going to save him. And he died for it. And, and that's the shocking thing about how this this improves a lot of what I didn't like. Like, I, I do like Death of Superman a little, but it does improve a lot of what I had problems with this and Reign of Superman, that, that entire story, into kind of the bare essential ideas you need to be a very strong, connective narrative. And speaking of, you know, Lex Luthor Jr. Yes, yes. I, I wanted to work on Can we go that. into yeah. the fact that like that fuck you joke was really good? It's <laughs> it's really good. When he shows up, like when he he rolls up to his, his house arrest building, I'm like, wait, are we getting it? And then he takes off the wig and, and the fake beard. And I'm like, oh, perfect. OK, cool. Uh, that 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 is such a tight way to explain it uh, for anyone who just like peruses the comics. It's like, oh, he was wearing a beard and, and a wig. Which is basically okay. true. Like you might as well do the Australian accent, too. Like, you know, good day. Yeah. Okay. okay. Speaking of Lex Luthor, <laughs> can you guys tell how much the animators love Lex Luthor in this movie and how animated that dude's face is? Because that dude is super emotive in these films. Like, the animators had so much fun with Lex because he doesn't do just angry. He does pithy. He does sarcastic. He does, like, you can see it on, on how they animate his face. He's incredibly expressive. More so than everybody else, because they, you know, they, they have so much fun with this guy. And Rain Wilson as Lex Luthor is really good yeah, casting. He did a great job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The only real scene that I had a problem with from a Lex Luthor standpoint, I know what they were doing is like when he walks into like all the scientists researching stuff, and he just starts pointing out their mistakes. In, and the reason why I have issues with it is that the things that he's saying are unprompted and don't necessarily make sense based on him just like walking past uh, like a guy studying a sample. Um, but aside from that, and it's, it's really just like these felt like placeholder lines that needed to be buffed up by the time it got out and they just never did. Um, aside from that, I really liked it all. I, I really liked that he was part of the final stand against doomsday. I thought I was surprised that it was a suit. When, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when doomsday starts ripping into it because he had a computer monitor on mm-hmm. and i was thinking like yeah he'll send a drone because you know he's under house arrest technically and he's operating in public he'll just be in a drone and like he'll still get the accolades because he was in a you know controlling this drone and like making a big speech in front of everyone uh oh it's like oh no he's actually inside of it <laughs> yeah <laughs> why <laughs> I, w- I, w- I was shocked it wasn't the traditional war suit it was like it was yeah it was a very kind of Arnim Zola kind of suit where he's just a big old head and a machine gun. Yeah, because they, they tease yeah. it like, oh, is it what you think it's, it is? When it comes suit. out of the ground, you're like, oh. Well, and because oh. that war suit is so close <laughs> to what we got at the beginning. Yeah. Like, it, it's so close. Like, if you had just told me that was like the Lex Luthor war suit, I would have been like, yeah, no, that makes sense. It's just like a little bit yellower instead of green. Like, but it was still like a yellow, like a greenish yellow. So, like, uh, it, yeah, it was just weird. It, you know, it, Weirdly, it made me think of, do you, do you guys remember the anime Cyberman? It was like early 90s. The The big thing was it was it was basically like a uh, like a Henshin style transforming superhero thing where this one guy could transform into this like armored mech form of himself. Um, and it turned out that like that would normally would like allow or would corrupt him and he would become part of like this like evil matrix of like advancing, you know, sentient machines. Um, And so he could only do it for like limited periods of time without getting transformed, you know, permanently stuck in this form. Anyway, in in it, humans study that, that tech and create like their own, like, like homemade, like human tech version of these like cyber forms. 
uh, th- to fight with. And they are, are more reliant on like guns and like human weapons as opposed to like these like energy swords and shit. And it felt like kind of that where it's like, OK, here's the human response to this advanced tech. And it's not going to measure up to this alien doomsday creature or, you know, this this machine of destruction that he is. Uh, uh, but it it felt like, OK, this is humanity's last stand right here. Like Superman is its own thing. But this is like mankind trying to show off that they can do anything and they'll do enough. You know, they get the they get the one good shot where they fire him into the the hall or uh, the hall of justice. And like, that's that's good. Good, good, good on you for like sort of establishing where the peak of humanity is in this scale. Like he can <laughs> he, he can show up like like Krillin and do a one good can. <laughs> <song. laughs> he did a good. Can. Yes. Yeah. He's solar flared. And it's like, good on you, Krillin. Yeah, no, it's actually yeah, it's a really Tian Shenhan with the uh, the the Kiko Ho. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, where he turns the triangle into a rectangle. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, man, if it... it's like it's like Vegeta like shooting Cell in the back as Gohan does the Kamehameha that kills Cell. Like, good job, Vegeta. You did something, buddy. You, you did it. Right. You, get, you get a cookie. Here you go, buddy. <laughs> you helped. <laughs> And I, I feel like it's it is apt to make a Dragon Ball Z comparison when we're talking about a Doomsday fight specifically, yeah. because so levels, much of Superman the power levels well, were factored in. <laughs> yeah, the fact you know power levels that we're talking about when we're talking about the the fact that it is a prolonged fight that is part of the story. Whereas a lot of times with like Superman media, uh, there's a story and then there's a fight and then there's more story uh, or however you like kind of structure it. But like you don't have the the huge fight with like people coming subbing in and out and like all you know that kind of structure feels much more like a shonen book you know, it's funny you bring that up because when doomsday punched wonder woman to a crater i had a flash of yamcha in the crater and it couldn't stop laughing <laughs> you don't have to compare them to her to yamcha <laughs> i know Hawkman. Hawkman's right there he should be in the crater yeah no hawkman is definitely the yamcha of the circumstance <laughs> As evidenced by him being taken out immediately. <laughs> hey guys, I'm like, here to help. Y- Yamcha <laughs> is Hawkman, Chetsu is Barry Allen, and Tien <sighs> is Hal Jordan. Because I think Hal Jordan would also make a triangle into a rectangle. The, yes. Yeah, this is all fair. And then obviously Piccolo is is Martian Oh, Manager. always. <laughs> yeah. So it's Batman. Um, yeah. What what I am surprised is they didn't have uh, Bat uh, Batman weirdly in the circumstances Krillin. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lex Luthor's Krillin. Lex, okay, okay, fair, so I fair. Guess uh, so like, Hercule. Oh, uh, I was I was about to say he, uh, yeah, Jirobe. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, Jirobe peaked <laughs> once. I swear he did. I mean, he he did a very important cutting off of Vegeta's tail. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> He showed up. We got the job done. Okay, we're we are way too far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to reel this one back in. Um, I am surprised that we don't have Supergirl. Like I'm like it would be very easy to have Kara Zor El operate as she does, and like not you know not have to explain Matrix, but just have her show up. And I guess maybe I'm not sure. So the the DC animated movies are are a big blind spot for me. Like I kind of just didn't pay attention as evidenced by the fact that I'm just watching this now for the first time. So I don't know if they did a story where they introduced her in this, this settings lore, but you know, it's also, she's the most iconic super family member outside of Superman. They didn't. But oh, they, they had an established, they had an yeah. establisher. but in justice league throne of Atlantis, John Henry Irons makes a cameo. So when John Henry Irons shows up, that's actually a carryover from throne of Atlantis. Because during the big Atlant- the Atlantean fight, uh, the Atlanteans attack a construction site. John Henry Irons is there. He tries to take oh, a wow. sledgehammer to one of the Atlanteans. Superman saves him, and he's like, and he's like, that's my guy. So that's <laughs> actually a carryover to from that movie. Okay, that's nice. yeah. The, I really liked how yeah. This is a good segue back to the the other super beings like it, it they did a great job setting up Hank Henshaw but but yeah having John Henry Irons there mm-hmm. and like working on armor tech yeah. yes you know <laughs> I, I I did have a note where it's like is all fucking armor based on like apocalypse tech in this setting like that I think is a little bit lame yeah. but you know what it makes enough sense for how could John Henry John uh John Henry Irons <laughs> like uh make that armor so quickly so it makes enough sense and it's you know him being tied to Lex Luthor makes enough sense like the or like or the tech, I mean, um, yeah, 
you know, that that's that's all fine. Um, and I loved that we had Dabney Donovan as our segue into getting Superboy. Like, that was so fucking perfect. <laughs> I was like, thank fucking Christ. We've got Dabney Donovan on this movie. <laughs> Uh, and, and the stuff with the Eradicator robot, or, or rather with, like, Superman's uh, ship and, like, sort of setting up that side for the Eradicator. You know, pre- pretty solid introductions for these things without it necessarily being too much of a, like, this will be important yeah, later. It's Aside from with Superboy, where it's just like, oh, no, he's still growing. And you're like, yeah, yeah we know, <laughs> we all know what this is. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's, it, it's, it's one of the benefits of this movie is that this is just a natural part of his world. And so, you know you get the top down view of the working class scientist guy like John Henry Irons being inspired by Superman. And you also get Bibba Babaski, which, you know, yeah. is such a huge part. Like you don't think about it, but he is such a huge part of the death of reign of Superman story, because in a lot of ways, he's the most every man reacting to this horrible event. Mm-hmm. And way to, I think we I think we brought this up in a previous podcast, but one of the most bold things this movie has done is end it with Bibba Babaski in the rain, crying, talking about how of all the yeah. people that they could have taken, why did it have to be Superman? Yeah, the whole the whole monologue he gives at the end. I was like, wow, this is this Chef's kiss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like this this, <laughs> this usually is very well done. This usually upbeat, like upbeat, larger than life guy is completely broken down by what's happened. And that's the perfect move setter for this kind of film. Yeah, because this movie did exactly what the Snyder universe failed I was to do. Just about the same <laughs> which is establish that the world really needs Superman. Like yeah. that it really it one that he is actually like a huge part of why they haven't been destroyed yet at this point. Mm-hmm. But but two, it's a world that really appreciates him. Uh, and like they could have taken it in interesting directions beyond that, but the fact that they nailed that aspect so hard is crazy because i feel like everyone forgets to do that in superman adaptations nowadays and like this is exactly what we needed without us having a full series to establish that you know it's one thing if a fight occurs in you know like the the season finale or series finale for like the animated superman or animated series superman like where he's been brainwashed and like we you know Mm -hmm. by dark side and there's a lot of like shit that happens as a result and people feel betrayed by superman that requires of a show normally to like establish how much they had looked up to and respected Superman yeah. Yeah. in that space. This does a really good job of getting all the cliff notes of it. And Bibbo is a big part of that. Jimmy's a big part of that. Like the, 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 all the people on the ground are a part of that. And also the fact that they all kind of feel like they have started to know each other and be like almost friends because of the existence of Superman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, Jimmy Olsen and Bibbo Babowski, like <laughs> being able to email pictures to each other is not yeah. a thing that would have happened in a world without Superman. Yeah. yeah. We're just random civilians just talking to the guy. He's, he's, yeah. he's our guy. Like that's the, that's the thing I like. That's about my Superman. guy. Exactly. Like <laughs> Superman is our guy where he's just, you talk to him and if he's not busy punching a giant robot or, you know, destroying asteroids over space, he's just our guy. He's just your friend that you can talk to. Even if it's over, like, yeah, hey, dude, you look great. Using new aftershave. Random, <laughs> random menial shit. He's our guy. And that's what the movie nails perfectly, is that he's this mm-hmm. very approachable dude that you could see why everybody likes this guy and everybody looks up to him. Even though, deep down, he is the biggest neurotic mess of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's, that's, the, that's why I love Superman. He's really great at being Superman, but when it comes to being a dude, kind of sucks at it. And that's where the story is. That's the meat and potatoes. And that's what wor- that's again, that's what works about this love story, because he has to you know, deal with that. Deal with the fact that he's a bit self-centered and he feels like, you know, I can't let Lois into this life because I'm I'm the all the world needs. And if I were to, you know, look away from it even for a single second, you know, I would never be able to forgive myself if something bad happens. And I don't want to lose Lois Lane. Like he's he's kind of dramatic, especially when we go into the Silver Age guy, where he's just all of that, and then some, mm-hmm. and then it becomes Freudian. Yeah, I mean they they definitely lay it on thick how much he he appreciates Lois, but how uncomfortable he is about opening up and being vulnerable. Yeah. It, it's really well done though. Like the the they thread this needle remarkably well. I mean, even to the point where like you see why he cares so much about Lois. Like she's the one, she's the last person standing against Doomsday. At, 
at, in it all. Like, you, you know, she like Superman's about to be killed by Doomsday and she throws a rock at him and like stands there and is ready to die. Yeah. Uh, and and Superman gets up for for one last push. And I this this also is one thing I, I really like about this, where the way they kill each other makes so much more sense <laughs> than the way in the comic where they just like kind of both successfully hit each other at the same time. Yeah. In this case, it's like definitely a killing blow. And also definitely Superman stabbed th- like through his entire body by the giant fucking spike that Doomsday produces at the end. And you're like, oh, yeah, no, I see why he goes down after <laughs> yeah. at the end of this fight. Like, Yeah. In, in the comics, it looks like, oh, I guess, you know, they forgot to ring the bell. The fight's over. Guys, guys. Hello. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> Well, it's like in, in the comics, it's like their life meters both hit zero. Yeah. Whereas in this case, like Doomsday, very clearly his neck is snapped uh, by this incredible yeah, th- <laughs> charge punch thing. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. I was like, of course, the way they kill him is with breaking his neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's Superman. I mean, he now. has a skeleton, you know, like he they, they do establish that he has bones and that they hurt. So it makes as much sense as anything. And also Doomsday isn't really dead. He's just incapacitated. Until he gets back up again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, when he gets knocked down, he gets up again. You ain't ever going to keep him down. Stop. <laughs> I could have stopped that. I chose not to. <laughs> Superman Doomsday, Chumbo Wumba. <laughs> yeah, well, I, was, I did, I did kind of chuckle to myself. I was like, oh, he's, he's, he's like powering up to do something big. He's going to punch him. The moment and that's going to be the, the, the moment big Case said he move. gets knocked down, I'm like Chumbawamba. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I was like, he's charging up to do something. He's gonna, is he going to punch him? And now he's going <laughs> to fly straight toward me and break his neck. Gotcha. <laughs> and then let the beat drop. Yeah. <laughs> no, what really should have happened was Superman should have taken a sword made of kryptonite and should have repeated slap Doomsday in the heart and then the brain <laughs> and then the knees and his ultimate weak point, an elbow. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and then we get the the fallout from the fight. We we set up all this all the the Superman imposters, but we get some good scenes of, of characters really mourning the loss of Superman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we the fact that Ma and Pa Kent are in Metropolis at the time allows us to do some of the scenes with a a little bit more economically than it would take if they were like, oh, we traveled out to Kansas to to hug and cry. You know, this they're they're all just there. Yeah. Um, and they, they do a good – like, one of the things I really liked in Superman Doomsday was the, like, the the repartee after Superman dies where Lois and, and Martha figure out that they know each – like, they both know. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and and this is a, a a more efficient version of that. And also the fact that Pa Kent is here yes. is, you know, part of that because that's part of the, the, the comic story you had. Everyone's dad is alive this time. <gasps> yeah. Well, and I, Martha isn't Martian Manhunter. Yeah. What a world. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, it, it's interesting that they didn't go into the whole podcast has a heart attack in the fields bit from the comics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did have notes that, and okay, so I still have not watched the return of Superman animated. We're, we are going to watch that for this uh, retrospective on the material, but I am trying not to get too far ahead of myself. Okay. <laughs> Especially because, like, it allows for, like, really great moments of being just very excited about this particular movie. I, I can't get over how much I, I liked it, considering that, like, still on paper, not that much happens. But it's done really well. Yeah. It it, it, it knew exactly if we're going to tell this story as its own movie. Yes, we got to make sure that Death of Superman is a third act thing. But we also got to make sure, A, we set up for the encompassing story, as well as gives superman in a, an actual character arc something that you know he's been lacking in these films because in these justice league films he is just i can't even say the tough guy he's wharf like he's the guy that's supposed to be tough but somebody comes along and backhands him and he flies through a wall yeah it's like look out captain this 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 giant this this tiny little child she's invading our our, our ship i must stop her we and he flies away like that's that was Superman in, in the uh, New 52 Justice League, where he was just Worf. <laughs> yeah. Uh, prior to that, he was TNG Worf. And in this movie, he gets to be Deep Space Nine Worf. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. He, he is getting back up against those Jeb Hadar. <laughs> I'm surprised Jeb Johnson didn't write a story where an empty barrel didn't fall on Superman's back and disabled him for life. Because he might as well have done that. <laughs> right. Only for him to realize that he had a second spinal cord. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that cyborg created because of a mother box. Because sure, why not? <laughs> yeah. That... <laughs> but Batman, that would, be very Batman easy... would have to lecture him to do it because that's Batman's role in his comics was to lecture people. <laughs> Sure is it sure is a good thing we figured out how to create artificial spines. It won't ever need to come up again, will it, Batgirl? <laughs> I Andrew. actually technically did because she she did get one. So right, I, yes, I'm not. Yes, <laughs> I will say that uh, on the fight scene on the bridge where he has him uh, chained up on by the suspension wires and the kids running towards his little game, and then Superman stops the the rocks from falling on him, and he's like he the kid hugs him. And he looks at him. When the kid looks at him, I was fully expecting Doomsday's hand to come through the rock and grab him right there. Who, the kid? <laughs> no, they grab Superman. Oh. Well, he's like, the kid's like, he's like, oh, the kid, like, he's thankful. He's, like, he's so thankful. He comes up and he hugs Superman. And they're staring at each other and the kid runs off. While he's staring at Superman, I was fully expecting Doomsday's hand to come through the rocks and then grab Superman because that's how bad the fight was going so far. I, I love that moment because <laughs> that moment is such a distillation of Superman where it's, yeah, he's getting his ass kicked. He saves his kid. He's bleeding. You can see the blood. The kid sees the blood. He grabs the kid's Game Boy Micro or whatever handheld <laughs> system. That I mean, it it felt like a switch light. <laughs> yeah, like switch. before was the switch made by that point? I mean, this was twenty eighteen. The, the switch was out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question is, was the switch light? And I think that was the year. It doesn't matter. It, it is a generic <laughs> video game system. He <laughs> gave him his handheld game. It, he gave yes. him his uh, PSP Vita. And so, but again, Superman redirects it from, here you go, kiddo. And the kid hugs him. And, and that's Superman. Like, he's, he's a giving person, even to the detriment of himself, where he's dying. But hey, you know, you forgot this, kiddo. He saw it and like, oh, shit, that's a nomad. You're, where'd you get one of these? No, you better hold on to this, kid. It's going to be valuable. Kid, is this a Zoom? What, what the heck is this? And he's like, wait, stop, Doomsday. Hold on. Who gave this to you? Is this a Neo Geo color? <laughs> what? Why that? did you buy this thing? <laughs> I need to have a talk with your parents, young man. Do I'm saying you sit right there. Hang on. I need to fi- get to the heart of this Turbo Express. <laughs> <laughs> Why did your parents even get you a Lynx? Is this a shiny Porygon? <laughs> you got a shiny Porygon? <laughs> oh, oh, man. The rails. We, we, we have gone so far past <laughs> Uh, before we go, because I, I you know, we kind of covered all the, the big beats and honestly, we've covered most of the things that happened in this movie. Um, I do. I do want to focus on the cast again for a moment because we, we mentioned it at the top, but uh, we've got Jerry O'Connell in this as Superman and Rebecca Romaine as Lois. And I, you know, and then all these other like great actors. Rain Wilson is a great Lex Luthor, yada, yada, yeah. yada. Mm-hmm. I, I do want to take a moment just to talk about Jerry O'Connell as it because. I think it does a really good job here, and I don't, I don't, I don't know why, but I just like Jerry O'Connell a lot. Like, yeah, I, I think it's because I grew up watching like My Secret Identity and Sliders, and like, I like I was so happy when he played Captain Marvel on the Justice League Unlimited, and I was like, no, this is perfect. <laughs> <We've> got, <laughs> like, this is great. And now I kind of feel like he's just living his best life. Like, he is married to one of the most famous supermodels of all time. He is doing Star Trek, and he's doing animated DC stuff, and like, just having fun. Just be, being a nerd. And then they then they go home and they watch Real Housewives. And then he shows up on Bravo just to talk about Real Housewives shit all the time. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, this is someone who is, like, kind of doing best life, even if he might be, like, too much of a super fan sometimes. Uh, yeah. So he just, just like, lives. yeah. He's having fun, Case. I mean, I'm just having fun. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember having this conversation with my friend who's a huge Captain Marvel fan. He's like, you can't do that. He voiced Captain Marvel. And I'm like, ah, history repeats itself yet again. Superman yes. for the win. <laughs> That's a mean Wiz Comics joke. I mean, if it was uh, Captain Marvel instead of Superman, maybe he would be throwing those cars at Doomsday instead of just like hitting him with it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Staying at uh, my guy reach. throws his cars. He doesn't smash it against the rock. And he flies. He's got a talking tiger. Yeah, well, my right. guy dresses. He has a friend that dresses like that tiger. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I just I like that element. I, I, I do think that there's good a good dynamic between him and Rebecca remain for their relationship. Um, but I, I, I just liked him as, as Superman. I thought that this did a really good job on that front. The, like the performance was really solid in terms of like selling this character who could put on the big blustery, brave voice, but had these moments of like introspection and like uh, nervousness, you know, like him asking flash, like, Oh wait, does Iris know? 
about your thing. Like, I, I didn't even <laughs> feel like we could let people know outside of our coworkers here, here in this boardroom of the Justice League. <laughs> Who we all know each other's secret identities and Bat all of our dating histories. I thought Batman said that was a no-no. <laughs> Listen, you can't date anybody, especially if they're cat thieves or international terrorists. Or whatever Silver Sea Cloud steel is now. <laughs> you know, it makes me think of like the in Invincible where it's like, you said not to t- like to tell my girlfriend my secret identity. Like, I figured yeah, when you first started dating, I figured you'd figure it out by now. <laughs> but uh, I, like, like I said, I just keep coming back to being like very impressed by this movie. Like it did, it does such a great job of having the the force of nature that is Doomsday, and as disruptive as he is, like show up in this moment and really break break the flow of everything. Like it does a great job of setting up. This is the status quo for Metropolis. This is the status quo for the Justice League. This is the status quo for the relationship of Superman and Lois, and how it's all progressing in ways that you expect one thing and then doomsday drops out of the sky and breaks it all. Like the mm-hmm. justice league is, is trashed this relationship that was about to be full on engagement. Like they're, they're dating. They just met the parents and she just found out his secret identity. Like this is supposed to be like the triumph of Superman in his personal life. And it is completely disrupted by this calamity effectively at work. And I think that that's such a, a great dynamic that they like really establish here. I, I'm just like, I said, I'm just floored at how much I ended up really liking this movie and really liking the fight itself, which I, I didn't expect to to have strong visual, visceral thoughts about. But like, oh, man, like the, the hits are great. The, the fight is great. The only thing I am missing at this point is that I really want to see a Fleischer Superman versus a Doomsday, like specifically a leaping tall buildings Superman. <laughs> yeah, because. God, would that be such a, an intense fight it, uh, and Metropolis would be destroyed. Yeah. But I think it would be like well, a really interesting rocky The battle. buildings will topple over, but I'll pick them up and put it back down. So it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, like, honestly, like, yeah, just do that. But like Doomsday's face turns into a laser. <laughs> I, I will say that I am happy that they broke this into two movies and yeah. didn't try to force everything into an hour and 20 minutes. That would be a nightmare <laughs> if you try to do yeah, both that's stories in do. one movie. <laughs> I'm glad that they gave, it, they gave it time to breathe because trying to cram Death of Superman, Return of Superman, Rise of Superman all into an hour and 20 minutes would have been what they never learned from their mistakes ever. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, and, and even then, it's like the kind of kind of the adage of like, if, if you see... The death, return, and Easter of Superman as like a three act structure, people assume like, oh, that's just a trilogy. Not necessarily <laughs> because that's the assumption that the second act is mm-hmm. made equal to the first two. When any other writer could say, well, every other writer would say no. The second act is longer than that because there's more meat and potatoes in the second act. And with this one, I I, I feel like we did such a great job with the first act of the story that anything else is only going to be just as good. Because we put in the effort and really took our time with this. And again, I, I appreciate the fact that it felt a little bit more grounded. Yeah. As yeah. a character story. Yeah. I mean, I realize we're going to compare it to Superman Doomsday a lot just by virtue of a, of it being a thing that we discussed recently on the show and being like literally DC's immediate prior attempt at doing the same story adaptation. But, you know, while while that movie was not. A failure. I, I I still put it around like a C in tr- like overall. I think there's some things that it does right, but it, it's just not as interesting as it, it should be, and we're not really attached to the characters. It this also does like this does a remarkably good job of setting up all the things that are going to happen in the following point in a way that that movie couldn't even do within its own own movie. You know, like all like the fact that that story has like, yeah, we're going to do clone Superman and we don't really like hammer home that like either this fight or some other thing, like it just doesn't do enough to like explain the, the, the second half of the movie. It feels like its own separate thing that just happens to be because of circumstances from the first half like we're in this point, but it doesn't they don't feel connected in any way, like thematically or any in any other regard, kind of like the opening uh, 30 minutes of uh, <laughs> of uh, Killing Joke. <laughs> Scotch. So do not remind me of that terrible movie. <laughs> what, with, it, with the beloved character. Oh, God. Paris Franz. <laughs> oh, God. Someone took me to see that movie on my birthday. It was terrible. <laughs> I watched that movie going, I wonder if Alan Moore would like this one because it's just <laughs> weird enough. I mean, not 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 the actual killing joke part, just the opening stuff where it's like completely non sequitur. It doesn't make any sense. And 
is completely irrelevant to the actual story. Oh, where if mm-hmm. you're like, that's not yep. bad. Honestly, I like how it runs. <laughs> People want Batman to explain or to mansplain what gaslighting is to, <laughs> to, 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 to Batgirl. <laughs> to Batgirl. As you know, Barbara, when I was pretending I wasn't Bruce Wayne around you, that's what I was doing. It was called gaslighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, so all of these movies are better than that. Yes. <laughs> Let's yeah. just say that part right <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> this is. And this is is shockingly good. The the fight is really good. The story is really good. The the character performances are really good. The only thing that I I really like walk away from this being like, uh, is the character designs and that they're stuck with these like new 52 era designs that just don't work as well. Like Superman's head is so big and then his neck looks so weird with the way they do the (laughs) collar and and then his giant neck muscles like it, it feels like he's being choked. Uh, because it like indents and then pops back out for like just how big his head is. Like they're they're just design elements that I'm like this is just not as, as it just doesn't look his good. His face looked um, bloated in Justice League War. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but once you actually get into the fight, uh, especially once the costume starts getting torn up, like look, you know, it's fine. Whatever. Like Doomsday is so fucking perfect. Uh, at every moment, uh, how he functions, like the when they're like, oh, it's, he's going for population centers. Like, yeah, yeah, that saying that as opposed to he's attracted to Metropolis because it has like a Kryptonian kind of smell. Yes. Yeah. Works so much better. <laughs> I, I I prefer Doomsday's uh, seeing a wrestling match. Yes, yes. Metropolis, Metropolis. <laughs> Who's ready to throw down? Doomsday, Doomsday is. is ready. Like that would have been Sunday, <laughs> Sunday, See, Sunday. If, if he ripped off his mask and he spoke like that, I would have loved the character. Bone saw is like ready. how do you how do you top you know a strong man superhero with a wrestling supervillain? <laughs> like I, it sounds yeah, crazy, like, but it's true. Like he just starts doing leg drops and then like, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Doomsday from the top rope. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a hold of superman oh it's a pile driver pile driver jimmy what the hell <laughs> man superman really didn't sell that punch oh he did that one. <laughs> oh, look out God. doomsday's got a chair a giant chair billboard <laughs> <laughs> uh but but yes, the, so the the fight that we got is really good. The doomsday that we got is is sufficiently scary. Like he he makes like scary growl noises as opposed to feeling like he he doesn't feel like a Bizarro, which is the yeah, other part. And like goodness. he has a lot of space where he could feel like a Bizarro. That I'm I'm glad that they they don't lean into. Like this it, this feels like its own type of physical powerhouse that isn't just a Kryptonian type power set. Even though he has like objectively close powers, like he's invulnerable super strong and has heat vision in this um the 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 way he handles himself is so brutal and so grounded like he he always wants to run at the thing that he's trying to kill like uh, unless he can't in which case he jumps you know i like there's no reason to think he can fly but like you know there there are certainly ways that they could present him like it it has this like feral quality to the way he attacks uh and that's so good and the fact that he's smart about how he fights is really nice. The fact that he's so fast, like I, I can't emphasize this part enough. Like the speed of this monster is really important because you need to, to really be scared because it doesn't matter if you have any, like if you can h- take a hit, you're going to get hit a bunch of times before you can even respond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it was good to like set up like, Oh yeah, the flash can try to fight him, but he'll, he'll, he'll hit you. <laughs> 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 and then what flash? Then what? Vibrate that very <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And like Marsh Manor is able to give like give a full attempt at fighting Doomsday. I thought that was really good. You know, it, it it's a big fight that takes up a, a big chunk of this movie and mm-hmm. it's still really good. It, it the advantage is they know how to it's not too much. It's not like to me, like just the war last 40 minutes. It's just them punching dark side. It's so tedious with here. They know exactly how you need to like frame this fight in terms of pacing it because pacing is so important because if this fight was just like the last half of the film i probably wouldn't like it because it's like oh okay we're just getting to see everybody get like thrown around like rag dolls and who knows maybe because we don't have you know matrix supergirl here doomsday is going to punch martian man really hard and he's gonna go splat but (laughs) Yeah, in here it's 
it's a very efficiently nicely paced fight yeah and i i like that especially once you get to the superman stuff and that he's he's trying to be clever and, and this is a he, like we bring up how he's wrapping up doomsday and these and the um the, the suspension wires that was a cool moment because we don't really get to see superman be a little bit more you know lateral thinking with his fighting lately Oh no, he's a punchy punchy. Yeah, he's just a blunt <laughs> instrument lately. And here he's he's trying to stop this guy by any means necessary before he has to get to that point where it's like, shit, I have to kill him. Yeah, because like here he tries he tries at least to yeah. like eliminate a lot of the collateral damage. Yeah. And give people time to get away. Sometimes. The other times he's getting thrown around himself. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, it's still kinda good to see. <laughs> yeah, he loses the ability to, to yeah. really stop it. You know, there, there's a really good spot where he, like, punches Doomsday up into the clouds, mm-hmm. and then, like, Doomsday takes control of yes. it. And, like, it works both because, like, Doomsday shows, what like, why, like, he is dangerous up close. Like, you can't, like, you can't let yourself get too close to him because he'll take advantage of it. Um, and then it doesn't let up. Like, even once he, like, when he grabs Superman's cape, I expected, like, oh, he's going to toss him. Oh, no, he's just swinging him so that he can get on top and, like, just, like, punch him all the way down to the ground. Yeah. Uh, and, like, that... Again, the choreography is just remarkably good. Let's say once they break through the clouds, the animation just goes up. Yeah. Because yeah. it goes really smooth. And that's where that's where the real money's at right there, where it's like just that last chunk of the fight. After and you can tell when like his, you know, animated clouds is kind of difficult. Once they break through the clouds, it becomes so so good looking. Just 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 mm-hmm. how it how the, the, the animation flows. And then you get all the good stuff. You get him saving kids. You get him. You get him being very clever with his powers. Like, like this is Superman operating at his best against the worst. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what you need. You don't get to see that very often. <laughs> Not really. Not handled well. You know, unfo- un- unfortunately, the because the comic sold so well at the time and it, it is was in the news and what was just very popular, at least as far as the zeitgeist understanding of Superman. Like this was the next big actual moment for the character, for people who probably wouldn't have even noticed Man of Steel or the reboots or anything like that, that it it is a thing that, you know, people are going to try to adapt a lot. Like it's a story that's really associated with the character. And that's why we've seen now two animated movies in the, like in this millennium. (laughs) It doesn't sound like it's that much, but like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and a desire to keep showing the character in, in every adaptation of Superman. Despite me. Like, yes. Or, or they'll <laughs> tease it in things like Superman and Lois. Right. Uh, Which where all yeah. The, was, yeah. So I'm glad that they did such a good version here because I was starting to get depressed thinking that the only good version that they were going to do that was actually this this story as opposed to like the subversion that like JLU did um, where it's not really doing that story it just happens to have doomsday. Um, like I, I thought like, Oh, I guess the comic is going to be the high watermark. And like the comic has some interesting stuff going on with it all again. Like, yeah, we can make jokes about like, Oh, it's not that sophisticated that it's just going down in panel count as we like count down to the end of the fight. But like that actually is a cool thing that they're doing and like is an artistic challenge for them. And we get to see the weird shit that's going on in the DCU at the time that this fight occurred, because it's the, the fight is such a popular thing. It's like, Oh, here's a snapshot of like, uh, no, remember when Guy when Guy Gardner had a Sinestro core ring? Oh, remember yeah. when? <laughs> remember who Bloodwind is? I guarantee the only reason anyone will ever use the like reference the character Bloodwind is they remember him from Death of Superman. <laughs> remember when Guy Gardner had to stop the like defeat the ghost of Sinestro to get that ring? Right. Yes, so, it was awesome. Where, yeah. <laughs> but but who is going to remember that normally? Like like. It's it's just not part of what the status quo is, but it was that little like snapshot. So that story is always going to be remembered. It's kind of the way, way like Dazzler on X Men is like always going to be remembered, remembered because she showed up first in Dark Phoenix. So <laughs> yeah, yep. like that character can't go away because it's just too popular as a result. Uh, but but this actually really surprised me. I did not think that they would do as good a job. I didn't think that I was going to care as much about this Superman once we actually got into the fight and the fact that he goes down was really going to matter in a way that like it fucking doesn't in Superman doomsday. And no. it definitely doesn't in Batman V Superman. No. <laughs> and I, I'm just blown away by how good this, this project was like, 
it, it, it again is still like a really like simple story of Superman's life gets disrupted by monster who ultimately kills him, but it's, it's done so well. So I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to talk about it. I'm really glad that this, like us wanting to like, look back on, on this era of Superman stuff, uh, prompted us to watch this movie because I hadn't seen it and I probably wasn't going to or be not because I wouldn't want to just because like there's so much to watch <laughs> and like <laughs> it didn't feel important enough like it felt like just like part of a slew of DC animated movies that they put out that were generally not that well reviewed so it yeah. wasn't like a thing that I was like you know racing to go watch uh, and then I see this one and I'm like oh this is actually fucking great yeah because we got that that whole line of movies that were very mediocre or meh and then the new 52 stuff happened. You're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll Can get around to this whenever I need to. <laughs> it was always on the list, but it was never on the list of a thing that I would watch with my wife. So it was definitely on the list of like things for me to put on when I have enough time to watch a full movie by myself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well I'm doing something else and that's just in the background kind of thing. Right. Oh yeah. So the, yeah, this was surprisingly good. Yeah. It's good. Would... It's really good. <laughs> it kind of caught me off guard. It's understandable because <laughs> we already we've been burned before. I mean, I'm not been yeah, burned like, because um, I'm the death of Superman hater. So, <laughs> well, because I grew up, I grew up in like the the early '90s, and uh, and I when I was not like, getting ready to go to high school is when uh, the JLU and all that stuff was on TV. So that was like my go to thing to watch. It was so good that even like my me and my parents would sit down and watch those shows at night because we, everyone loved them. And to like come go from that to like the new fifty two stuff when everyone's like, eh, I don't care. To come back to this to be like, oh, this is good. Oh my god, this is actually really good. I really enjoyed this movie. It was quite a shock for me. Yeah, I, I'm really <laughs> excited to watch the return <laughs> because I wasn't before. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm interested. Now, I'm now interested to is, see your reaction to the return. Yeah, I, I'm. Wait, have you I'm seen curious, it already, like, Duke? Yeah. yeah, I'm nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm excited. Like, I, you know, there's there's room for like, I'm not like going to try to like put too much hope on it. But like, I, I, I am excited because I, I this took me from uh, a, a tepid uh, approach to then being really satisfied with this all. I, I would say if someone wants to experience Doomsday for what it's worth, like if someone wants to consume that that battle, this is probably the best best version to observe. At the very least, it's a good pitch to like. People like, you know, why should I like this character? What it, like, how do you tell a Superman story? And it's like, as much as I don't want to say a death of Superman adaptation, I would say the Superman lowest stuff is the story of Superman. Yeah. Yeah. The big monster at the end isn't the story itself. It's, it's basically a guy who is trying to represent the best of us and best of himself and learning what that means. And this movie conveys it perfectly. Yeah, like this is the dragon that the knight has to go fight, and it's appropriately scary and dangerous and not sympathetic in any way. And you don't know if they can win because it just doesn't look like it. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it do, it does a really good job there, and like it does a good job of setting up the status quo for Superman at the top. You know, it does a good job of making us think that this is the Superman that like pop culture has always had, but has had a hard time of re-upping in more recent years. So I I'm just, I'm I'm just really glad to finally watch it. I'm I I am <laughs> I am happy to say that I was completely wrong going into this one. I uh, don't get to say it often. I, I I'm just thrilled. I I, I yeah I, I I I'm just shocked at at how solid of a production it was, and in all areas, animation, performance, choreography, pacing, just just great. So. Uh, Duke, thank you for coming on to chat with us about this movie. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, if people want to find you or follow you, uh, give give your plugs. I am on Twitter and I am Duke of Doom at Prof, Prof of Evil. Uh, I was on another social media site and unfortunately Hive kind of like went down or something. So I got out of that quickly. So just find me on Twitter. While it, while it lives. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have not looked we were talking about this on a call I was on yesterday where it, it was like oh yeah Hive went down and I hadn't heard that but then it sounds like it might be back it doesn't matter we're we're waiting for the dust to settle to be like okay where's the party at alright we'll find <laughs> out 
Uh, but yeah, look, f- everyone should follow Duke on Twitter if Twitter is still around when this episode comes out in a couple of weeks. You know, who can say? Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, they can find, well, they can find me on Twitter at Case Aiken. They can find me on Hive if Hive is the place where the party is at, uh, at Case Aiken. They can find me Hive on Instagram. Or or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a Mastodon, but I don't even know how to, like, say, like, you can find me at this thing because I'm like, I think I might only it's a server thing, which is like our Discord server where you can find me on the CPOV Discord. Uh, there are, is a link on our website. There's links all over. It's on all of my bios. Come join us on Certain POV. It's a great time. We like to talk about comics, movies, music, uh, books like it, it's just a great place. Uh, so check that out. Uh, J Mike is on there sometimes too, but oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's one place you can find him. Where else can they find you, J Mike? Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at J Mike 101 for however long Twitter decides it's going to be around. <laughs> Cause I'm like, man, I might have to take a social media break for a while. <laughs> yeah. It might be just like a good time for us all to reset and then, and focus on other things like, yeah. like, like this podcast where, which you can find at certain POV.com or wherever you get your podcasts, you can find lots of great shows at certain POV.com. Oh, and oh, can I plug something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By all means. Uh, I am working with my friends on a fan comic called Superman Triumphant Delight. It is a story of Superman during the Great Depression as this young farm kid goes to the big city for the first time. It is written by my buddy Elk and my best friend and brother in arms, Jazz. And it is incredibly gorgeous to look at because Jazz is a hell of an artist. And it's incredibly sentimental. And it represents basically this, this guy who represents you know, the champion of the downtrodden during one of the most grueling, oppressive days in America, American history. So, yeah, I'd love to plug that. Oh, yeah. OK. Yes. Everyone should be following this project because I uh, love love to hear about fan stuff for Superman that really gets it. So, yes, everyone should check that out. And we'll, we should have you back on to talk about that. Like, it's it's still in, in progress, right? We We have two issues done. They are online and we are working on a third one right now. And I'm an editor, so so. Uh, when the third one drops, we should probably try to get every y'all on and just to Definitely. just to chat about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, uh, so people should check that out. Uh, they should check out the Certain Point of View YouTube channel, which is uh, Certain POV Media. Uh, we've got clips of this show. We've got clips of some of our other shows, like Side Quests and Another Pass up there. We've got my Superman analog videos. Uh, those are all fun ones to check out. So. If you're looking for video content, that's there. Uh, otherwise, certainpov.com. So many great podcasts. Check all those out. Um, but until next time, when we will be talking about World Without a Superman, the inter arc between the death and the return of Superman, I hope you all just have a great week and stay super. Man. Men of Steel is a certain POV production. Our hosts are J. Mike Folson and Case Aiken. The show is edited by Matt Storm. Our logo is by Chris Batista. Episode art is by Case Aiken. And our theme is by Jeff Moon. I, I regret that we wa- uh, that we did Superman Doomsday or like in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I wish that we had done it closer together. And my original thought was that that was going to be a post All-Star Superman episode. But then we didn't get the Science of Superman one or Science Sort of, of Superman one in the can in time. Um so we had we had to run it because it was the only thing we had uh, that could go that week. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but uh, it would have been really nice to do these like closer together. So I so it was fresher because I wasn't like I, I rewatched this one. Like I watched this last week and then I watched it again last night. I wasn't going to do that for Superman. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't blame you. I don't blame you. But I think I seen that movie like once and I'm like, all right. You're like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Video games are a unique medium. They can tell stories. Immerse us in strange, fantastic worlds. Blur the very boundaries of our reality. But at the end of the day, video games are fun. Whatever fun is to you. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt A.K.A. Stormageddon. And on Fun and Games, we talk about the history, trends, and community of video games. It's a celebration of all the games we play and all the fun we find within them. And there's so many more games out there. So we hope you'll share in that conversation with us. Fun and Games podcast with Matt and Jeff. Find us on certpov.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And happy gaming. CPOV. Certainpov.com.